we're seeing is if there's pain mostly. With some of the supraspinatus tests, we're actually trying to detect if they have the ability to do certain motions, not just pain. So, the, two, the most common rotator cuff tear is a supraspinatus tear. So there are established orthopedic tests for that supraspinatus. The most important part of the supraspinatus test is that we have to have the shoulders in a different plane of motion. So this is the frontal or coronal plane. For the supraspinatus test, they have to be in the scapular plane. So that's like 10 to 20 degrees forward of the frontal or coronal plane, so it's here. It's different, slightly different for everybody. Really, what it is, it's the plane that's in line with the glenoid fossa. So the glenoid fossa is here, so rather than being out like that, that's here for this skeleton. And that's because the glenoid fossa are facing forward, but so the plane's going to be slightly different. So the empty can test, what I like to do is it's, it's an active test. Actually, let's do drop arm first. It's, this is how you. This is the order you do it clinically. You want to do the Codman's drop arm first because it's probably a slightly better test than, than empty can, uh, and it's a little bit more. It's a little bit more stressful test because we're going to be doing some eccentric contraction. So Codman's drop arm test. We're going to be doing this passively, and you bring the patient's arm in arms into the scapular plane, thumbs down, so they're internally rotated, and then you passively bring the patient's arms up to about 90 to 100, 110 degrees of abduction in that scapular plane. And then you ask the patient, go ahead and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let your arms go. I want you to keep your arms up here. So you, you let them hold their arms up and you slowly let them go and say, okay, now what I want you to do is slowly and controlled bring them down to your side of them. So they bring it up there. They're able to contract the muscles. Then they bring it down to their side. And that would obviously be a negative if I could do all that. If I had a supraspinatus tear, you may, you may passively put the patient here and say, okay, what I want you to do is hold your arm up there I'm going to let it go, and they might be like, oh, I can't hold that arm up. That's, I can't even do that. So that's a positive finding, and that's a failed test. Uh, and that would indicate a supraspinatus tear. It's, they can, it's not that they can't hold their arm up because it's weak. It's probably a little bit weak, but mostly painful, and that's the reason they don't want to hold it up. Because the supraspinatus doesn't do a lot of abduction. It's mostly the, the deltoids that, that do the abduction. Supraspinatus is very little bit. But... In that scapular plane, we're stressing supraspinatus a lot more than the deltoids, so it's probably going to hurt. Now, if they have a complete tear of their supraspinatus, it may not hurt, and they might actually be strong enough to hold their arms up like that. So then we have them slowly and controlled bring it down, and if that's the case, and, and all they're controlling it is with the deltoids, they'll start seeing some weird motion happen at the shoulder. They'll start kind of hiking that shoulder. They might be, not be able to do it as controlled as the other uh, as the other shoulder, and it would probably hurt a little bit more. So that's why we do both of those parts. So the, the Codman's drop arm is up here like this, passively. So we position the patient there, and then we say, go ahead and keep your arms up there. I'm going to let them go. So slowly. It's not like we're, we're surprising them. And then they slowly lower. There's a lot of different ways to do this test. Yeah. So then not being able to do it all is positive, but is any pain well, it's got to be in the shoulder. Yeah. Any shoulder pain on this? Yeah. Potentially. You'd have to compare it to the other supraspinatus test, the empty test. Uh, well, really, the, the classical positive is the inability to do those. And, you know, just too much pain to keep your arm up there. If they're getting pain, but they can do it, it's, it's a positive, but it's not a hard positive. So, there are other ways. If you look this up on YouTube, you probably find like 10 different ways of doing cognitive drop on tests. And another way that I've seen it done is you passively bring the patient's arm up, same way you just did, that I just explained. And then you say, okay, what I want you to do is completely relax your, your arms. And I'm going to let your arms go, and I want you to catch them. So completely relax, and then you let them go, and they boom, ballistically catch their arms. Um, then it makes a lot of sense. If you do have even a slight tear, that's probably going to provoke symptoms. It's a little bit more ballistic, and it's probably not the uh, the most common way to do cognitive drug arm test. So if you see it, um, that's it's probably just as valid. A lot of these shoulder tests have been found to be valid uh, in, in different ways of performing the test. So it's hard to say one's better than the other because they've both been, or a lot of these different ways have been validated in the research, unfortunately. But the way that it's described in the notes is the way that, that I'll have you do it. And it's a, it's a good test that way. And that empty can test, uh, this is an active test, so the patient is going to, you're going to instruct the patient on scapular plane. 
usually I just say I want your arms here and I want you to bring your arms up like this but keep them a, a little bit forward like that. So the patient will start like that and they bring them up like that. So, and I explain it like this. I want you to, like you're holding two glasses of water or two cans and you don't want to spill them. You bring them up like this. And then once you get to about 90 degrees or so, right here, I want you to dump the cans or the glasses up and then bring them in. So, it's emptying the can. That's why it's called empty can. It's, just, it's like you're pouring out the can. Apparently back then, the people that did shoulder, uh, shoulder tests were either soda addicts or alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> empty nice can. What's that? Yeah, they were just being nice to us instead of putting their last names on it. Right, right. Yeah. I think Something they were drunk. useful. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure they were drinking. <laughs> <laughs> so, empty can test. Like this, empty the can, bring it down. This is sometimes called Job's test as well, so there is a person's name, where they, but it's more commonly called empty can test. So those are testing supraspinatus. You could actually do a, a supraspinatus muscle test in that same empty can position and just do an isometric contraction. That's not part of empty can test, but a lot of docs would do that. Just know that if you're testing the abductors of the shoulder with the shoulder in internal rotation and in the scapular plane, you're testing specifically supraspinatus. It's been studied. Uh, and, it, and it's a pretty good test. You're taking delts out of it a little bit, be, deltoids, because you're actually packing the shoulder a bit more, and, and you're twisting the insertion of the delts to a position that, that is not biomechanically that good for the deltoids. Isn't it important to do resistance on the way up or just on the way down? Uh, with what? For Empty hand? Yeah. It shows in the picture you have, it shows like he's pushing, it has some resistance. Mm -hmm. um, that might... It, it, in the in the lab handout, we're not having you do it with uh, a lot any resistance. Uh, this it's just a passive. Gravity is enough resistance for this test. If you wanted to make it maybe a little bit more sensitive, you should put some resistance in front of the picture. A lot of dots will, and that's it's completely valid. I just want you to know the baseline test. Um, so then, the rest of the rotator cuff, not very commonly torn or strained. So you don't have to worry too much about these tests for specifically for rotator cuff, but I do want you to understand how to test a muscle. And this tends to be a, a concept that's confused a lot of students. So everybody seemed to get it when I was talking about it in the last class, then they went to do it, and they were all over there. So test the muscle, you have to have that muscle what? Contract. Okay. And then you have to know which way the muscle contracts. And this is what screws everybody up. I don't know why. Probably because we don't teach it that much. In but if I need, let's say I want to test the function of infraspinatus and teresminer, what do they do in the shoulder? That's the first problem, I think. What do they do in the shoulder? Like this, the Externally rotate the shoulder. So how do we test them? Resistance. Yeah. There you go. How do you do that? Perfect. Good. You resist external rotation. How about subscapularis? What does that muscle do? Internal rotation. So how do you do that? Muscle test? Resist internal rotation. There, uh, and then subscapularis has a specific test for it called Gerber's liftoff test. That's the one with the back. Yeah, it is. <coughs> oh, that was a Oh, you, you've read the notes. How many? Show of hands. Oh, who else recognizes Gerber's? That's good. This, one, this one's hard to do, actually. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not an easy test because really what you're doing is, what, what motion am I doing on my shoulder to get my arm behind my back? Internal. Internal rotation. So you're already shortening subscapularis quite a bit. And then this also tightens up my shoulder capsule quite a bit too. And the idea is I should be able to lift my, keeping my elbow bent and not moving it and keeping my wrist straight and not moving that, I should be able to bring my hand off my back like this. And what I'm doing is I'm further internally rotating to get there. So it's really like maximal internal rotation of my shoulder and being able to contract my subscapularis. What a lot of people end up doing is this, or one of, 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 of all of these things, either this, <laughs> that's not what we want, or this, and that's just elbow extension, or this. <laughs> this is kind of a combination of a lot of compensatory motion. Now really what you want to get is, you want to see minimal anterior push of the shoulder. You're going to get a little bit, but you shouldn't see a lot of that. 
you should be able to get that. And you have to really lift the elbow, make sure my elbow is maintaining its angle. Instead of extending it all. So there's a lot of different things that'll happen here. So if what I tend to do is I look at the patient from the side and I'm looking at the front of their shoulder and their elbow and making sure those are staying relatively quiet. There's gonna be a little bit of movement of both, but it's not gonna be moving my shoulder forward and it's not gonna be pulling my elbow back. And then any of those other things where I'm just bending my wrist. That's, it's a problematic <coughs> test because it's hard for the patient to understand what you want them to do. And how do you describe it? I just say, I want you to keep your wrist straight, keep your elbow bent, don't move either of those, and try to bring your hand off the small of your back. It's usually the only thing, and still, patients will misunderstand that, because it's hard. It's not an easy move to do. And you find that it's a valid part of the examination to show them if you've yeah. verbalized it to work? Yeah, I show them. That's what I want you to do. I don't tell them what they do.